The title of my sermon today is, is a very simple, straightforward title. A title that um, me and Pastor Jackie came up with when we were driving, but, but it's, it is a message that's been on my heart for quite some time, particularly when in our home groups um, in Waltham, so we were studying the book of Ruth, and the book of Ruth talks about a famine. And we're going to look at that, but we're going to look at different famines of the Bible. So the title today is Famines of the Bible. Amen? Who's heard this sermon before? Anyone? Praise the Lord. One person has heard it somewhere in Philippines, maybe, you know. But for the rest of you who haven't, great. Good start here. So this is a, a really, really a good subject. A subject that is born throughout the Old Testament. But when we get to the New Testament, there is not much mention of it, which is for a reason, and we'll get to that reason in a moment. But uh, I just want you to, to, to have your attention, and I just want you to come on this trip with me. Is that okay? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I just want to say this, and I just want to put this disclaimer out there, that uh, this isn't a message uh, uh, for anyone in particular or, or being preached at someone because as pastors we we sometimes know a lot of situations and we don't we don't create or, or, or create our messages around situations of people we bring what the Lord gives us now if that speaks to someone praise God because the Word of God should speak to people but we are preparing our messages for the entire congregation now, if, if certain things may convict you, speak to you, praise God for that. But the intention is not to target any particular individual or family or a particular situation. The intention is to bring the undiluted word of God to all of us. Amen. I just want to say that before we start. And there's only three points, three straightforward points that we are going to tackle today. Amen. Amen. What is Famine, how a famine affects us, and what should be our response in a famine situation. Just three simple points there for us to take away home today. Now this message might in speak to you directly, and then when a message speaks directly to us, our, our brain receives it and applies it there and then and, and takes action. But then sometimes there's a message that your brain looks at and says, mm, I'm not really in that situation right now. But you may get into that situation. Or you may encounter somebody else who is in that situation and you can help them through that situation. So every message that is preached in a church is for each and every one of us. Amen? Yeah. So stay with me. You may say, well, that, that's not really for me right now. But I just want to tell you that there may be a stage in your life that you've been or may be in in future so in that case you still need this message in order to retain the content and apply it when the time comes yeah. and then there are some who may have had an accident in the past and their brains just don't respond to any word and I hope that there is nobody in that category here today so let's just receive the word of God and let's uh, take home what, what the Lord's going to speak to us. So starting with the first point, what is a famine? Now the encyclopedia defines it as famine is severe and prolonged hunger in a substantial proportion of the population of a region or country resulting in widespread and acute malnutrition and death by starvation and disease. We all know that, okay? But that is talking about a physical famine. And a lot of the times, there were accounts of physical famines in the Bible, but they had spiritual impact on people. Amen? Amen? Yes. If I take away your money, it's going to have a physical impact on you, but it is also going to disturb you psychologically. Yes. How can he do that being a pastor? He took away my money. You know, so things that happen to us naturally, they also have spiritual, emotional, psychological impacts on us, particularly to do with hunger. Okay? You know some people just can't handle that. 
You know that, right? I might be one of them. But you know some people when they are hungry, they're just not in the right mood. You know, maybe, yeah, yeah, you, you, you talking to you? Right, okay, okay. You know, for some it's the tea. For some it's the coffee. We were having a chat with, with uh, Sister Roby last Sunday. I said, you know, this is, you know, you're helping people to satisfy their addictions. And she said, yes, brother, yes, I know. I said, you know, some will just come running and they say, give it to me. Right now, I want it. Where is it? You know, and you take the coffee and then you just feel so good. For me, it's tea. Okay, and, and that's, that's, that's fine. Because we have become subject to such kind of things. For some, it might be ugali. For, for some, just a handful. Okay, for a lot of you, it might be biryani. Okay. For some, it might be the English breakfast, vegetarian, you know, in this case. But, you know, food, we are all dependent upon food. And I'm going to make a point towards the end, which will actually help us why uh, fasting is important for us. And we'll, we'll get to that towards the end. So famines that happened in physical form had both emotional, psychological, spiritual impacts on people and we're going to look at them. We're going to look at different stories of famines and we're going to learn how they affected people, what type of famine it was, how they responded to it and what was God doing in the midst of the famine situation. Now the famine is not limited to food. There can be famine of provision generally, not enough money. Famine of, of providence. We just don't have enough finances. We are always short on money. You could be in that kind of famine. Not enough boys for you to choose from. You know, not enough men left in the world. Famine of men, which is why you're single. Okay? I'm just saying it. It could be the case, you know, that you are going through that situation. That the type of man, maybe, maybe I should say, maybe the type of man you need. There aren't many left in the world. There's famine for that. We've got to pray. We've got to see what we're going to do in that situation. Okay? Yes. Women, there are abundance of them. Don't worry about that. There's so many of them around there. If you can't find one here, I'll take you to Uganda. Okay? <laughs> anyway. There can be different types of famines. Right? I see some youngsters smiling. Praise the Lord. Amen. Um, a famine of perhaps not having enough of spiritual input in our lives. Not enough fellowship. There was a famine of physical fellowship during the times of COVID. We were starved. We were starving to meet together. Amen? I was, I don't know, most of you, were you? Right? You're missing out on, on meeting together, home groups. You see, while we were missing out, there were parties in, uh, in, in some number 10 place, anyway. All right, um, we won't go there. But anyway, there was starvation. People were stopped from fellowshipping. So that spiritual famine could come in many shape, forms, or styles in our life. And, and I tell you, there are even famines right now that you may not know that you need to address in your life. Maybe not enough of the word of God is going into us. Maybe not enough of the worship. My sister, famine of prayer. People suffer from the famine of prayer. So I encourage you to come and join the prayer workshop. Let us encourage each other to pray. We have time to eat. We have time to go to work. We have time to do everything else in the world. Even argue. But we don't have time to pray. I'm so busy. I'm just missing out on prayer. But if you're so busy, did you miss out on your meals as well this week? If you're so busy, did you miss out on everything else? Did you miss out on your work? No, those things are distraction and we are in the famine of prayer. Prayer got to increase in the church if you want to get somewhere. Amen. A quick Lord is my shepherd or a quick our father in heaven is not sufficient. Famine of the prayer. We were in the famine of missions. Me and Pastor Johnny were discussing yesterday. He said, I'm taking back the ground. I said, me too. He said, we're going to do more missions than ever before because for two years we were stopped. 
We couldn't go anywhere. Yes. So what we do, we go more. Yes. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. So we go more. Because the famines of the missions is now over. Hallelujah. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. We can go and travel. Yes. But you see, the problem is what a famine does to us. Is that some get used to of living the famine lifestyle. And then they never come out of that famine because they've just got used to of it. Used to of not going to church. Used to of not fellowshipping. And I praise God that we push through during that time. Amen. We push through with those markers that were between the seats. We push through with the masks. Some of you obeyed. Some of you didn't. That's okay. The Lord will take care of that. All right. But we push through through all of those things. And we continue the fellowship. Yes. But there are places they have lost congregation while we have gained congregation because we pushed through the famine. Yes. Amen. We didn't compromise. We didn't give in to it. We said, Lord, we are going to continue no matter what. Yes. Because there was wisdom in it. If we would have, it would have been easier to shut the doors down, you know, wake up about sort of quarter to ten, set up the Facebook live feed, and there you go. And after that, we were having sometimes parties please just live on Facebook doesn't really matter anyway anymore we were having breakfast parties you know come let's eat together as well it was up to 30 people though by the way it was work event it was after the you know the, the live sermon and things that we did so under work events it's, it's okay um, Prime Minister said that um, so yeah praise the Lord so that famine is over and we must get back to normal Amen. all the bad habits must go yes. all that laziness must go all that we have missed out must go and we should start serving God start doing the things that God wants us to do Amen. starvations if we got used to of not praying if we got used to of not doing enough if you got used to just working from home, for some it's a blessing, for some it's not, for some it's a, it's a get out of jail card, you know, whatever it may be. But we need to get back to the routine of how things are supposed to be, not how the famine taught them to be. Amen? Are you with me? Yes. Are we getting somewhere there? Yes. Amen? Yes. Now, I've got a question for you. Um, where were Israelites? Before they came to promised land. Egypt. Egypt. Okay. Okay. Very good. Who said that? Yeah. That's the right answer. That's okay. They were in Egypt. Where were they before Egypt? Canaan. Okay. Okay. Where is Canaan? Where is Canaan? So before they go to promised land. Okay. Some of you getting this and some of you are like, okay, okay, I didn't see that before. So they were in Egypt. Before Egypt, they spent 430 years in Egypt. Where were they before Egypt? Somebody said Canaan. What is Canaan? Israel. Israel. Land of milk and honey. What is the name of the promised land? So before, come on, is, are, you, are you putting this together? They were in the promised land before they go to the promised land via Egypt. For 430 years. And we're going to dissect that and we're going to see what went wrong in that equation. That they were already in the promised land. Okay? We're going to look at that in a moment. Canaan is promised land. So when the Bible says that God told them to go into, He told them to go back to the place where they were supposed to be in the first place. But Egypt came in the middle. They became slaves for 430 years. Sister Mirella, we got a verse for that, right? Exodus chapter 12 says this here. The people of Israel had lived in Egypt for 430 years. Before that, they were in? No, promised land. Yeah, Canaan equals to promised land. So what went wrong in the equation? What happened? How did they end up in Egypt for 430 years? It was a famine. Great. Excellent class today. 
excellent class today. I want this congregation every time I preach. Okay, this is a good one. Praise the Lord. So they were in the promised land before they got to the promised land. But they spent 430 years into slavery. Generations after generations after generations after generations. I think that's about right. In slavery. How and why? That is an important question. Maybe you never looked at this. Maybe nobody taught this. Maybe you never studied this. Hold on a second. We talk about God doing wonderful miracles of taking the, the Israelites out of Egypt, parting the Red Sea, sending the ten plagues upon the Egyptians in order to set the people free. Who could have avoided all of that hassle if they didn't go to Egypt in the first place? Am I speaking to somebody here? Yes. Have, you, have, you, have you discussed that before with somebody? Have you, have you ever brought that in conversation? That the greatest story of redemption and freedom and liberation ever written could have been avoided. It could have been avoided. The miracles, the, the, the problems that we walk ourselves into can be avoided if we can take some precautions. See, there's a story of great miracles and success for the Israelites. But there's a story of a failure on their behalf as well. And that is what I want to discuss today. Why they ended up there? It's because there was famine. You see, enemy comes in at the times of famine. So our response at the times of famine is what matters. Our maturity in Christ is tested in the times of famine not when everything is great when everything is great it's great in fact your friend's character is tested when you're in famine yeah. come on yes. i'm speaking to somebody yes. your friend's characters your acquaintances that you hang around with their character is tested when you are going through famine god's favor upon you also tests their character some people rejoice when you succeed. Some people stop calling you and say, ah, yeah, I know you, Sister Morella. But since you've had business, you know, you've got so much money now. Yeah, yeah, you don't talk to me. But yeah, yeah. You're receiving that. <laughs> you know. So, the favor of God and a famine test the character of people around you. And it tests our character. Forget about the other people. We need to take responsibility for our character. See, it's under pressure. It's under situations like famine when our character is tested. A sad story to share. In 2015, we did our first um, mission to Malawi. At that time, it was one of the poorest countries in the world. East Africa is probably not the second or the third, but it's still very poor. And uh, somehow, you know, uh, we, we got there and, you know, the Lord blessed us. We took a lot of donations and when the mission was planned, there was no signs of floods or anything. But just two weeks, three weeks before we were to, to travel, we uh, heard from our host that there's been a series of floods through Malawi. And there's been a lot of devastation, you know. The floods have destroyed people's homes and things like that. And we even gave a call here and, and a lot of you gave and a lot of people gave and we, we took all of those donations there. And we were able to, to distribute a lot, 7.5 tons of maize. I have never seen that much maize in my entire life. Never done that distribution, but the anointing came and the Lord helped to do that type of distribution. I tell you, it's hard. People fight over food. Good people, good families, Church going families would queue up second time and third time, even though they had taken their share. Because famine makes you crazy. Famine makes you act the way. So a physical situation is affecting their spiritual life. They want to steal the maze. Things got heated. But praise God, it was sorted somehow. The Lord managed the situation. We, we gave towards buildings, churches, all that stuff. And the pastor said, I thank God that you came with a blessing. I thank God that you came not only just to preach the gospel, but also bringing gifts into these villages. He said, I'll tell you why. 
Because before you came, in a lot of these villages, Muslims came and they distributed blankets, water filtering systems, things like that, on the condition if they will renounce their faith and become Muslims. And guess what? Most of them did. Famine makes you do things which are against the word of God, which are against your character, against the will of God. This is why it's important and this is why the Bible talks about all of these passages, what happened in famine. So we got to look at some of them and learn from those situations. So one thing, don't go to missions empty handed. God will provide. If you have a desire to take donations, aid, the Lord will provide. Especially traveling to poor countries, the Lord will provide. We recently traveled to Uganda, the Lord provided 6,000 pounds. 6,000 pounds. And that went a long way. Every place we went, we were able to give. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Every place we visited, they're like, praise God. Sister Florence, she was like, praise God for all of this. There have been so many projects pending, but the Lord has provided. Oh, you know? So, God works, and when we have a desire to give, He helps us. Amen? And He who lends to the poor, lends to the Lord. Be generous when there's a call for mission. Be generous. When there is a call, especially for missions to countries like Uganda, you know, you know, a lot of the poorer places. Having said that, I'm going there in June, so yeah. that, 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 that part was just to set you up. Amen. No, but free will, free will. Whatever you do, do out of free will. So famine drives people into situations that they shouldn't. Sometimes we put ourselves under famine. Voluntarily. I'm going to put myself under famine of not reading the word of God. So, we have put ourselves under famine. I'm not going to go to church. We put ourselves under famine. We put ourselves in situations. And we go to Egypt, which represents the world. Egypt represents. So, whenever I refer to Egypt today, that means not the will of God. Amen. Turn to somebody next to you and say, Egypt equals to not the will of God. But there are times when God may allow Egypt for a brief moment. But those times must be determined and ordained by God, not by me. Amen. I must not decide when I go to Egypt. I must not decide when I go into a particular place. But God must decide. Amen. He must speak to me and tell me to do that and then I'll do it. So here we look at in, in Genesis, there was famine in the land. Okay. In Genesis chapter 12, we're going to look at Abraham and the famine. Okay, and it says here that Abraham in verses 1 to 3, it says that God, God called him to leave your country, your native country, your relatives, your father, your family. And he calls him to go to a land, a land that he was going to give him as the promised land. And there the Lord said, I will bless you. I will honor you. I will multiply you. Amen. So this land that the Lord told Abraham to come to is Canaan and the evidence is in the preceding verses in verses 4 to 6 and if we look at particularly verses 5 and 6 here in Genesis 12 you see when they arrived in Canaan Canaan is the promised land for them yes. so the Lord took him told him to come to the land that was promised to him the promised land Canaan Abraham traveled to the land as far as Rachel. There he set up camp beside the Oak of Moray. At that time, the area was inhabited by Canaanites. And you know, Abraham also did some battles and things like that. And he just exploded in that land in terms of blessings. And he was prosperous. But we, we read further uh, in verses uh, 7 to 9. And it again talks about you know, that Abraham was traveling through the land and he came to a place called Bethel to the west. Bethel. Remember Bethel? Yes. This is the place Israelites went again to after Egypt. And another place is mentioned here. Ai or I. Michelle likes to, you know, she was telling me this is I. I said this is Ai. Um, <laughs> you know, but anyway, whatever it is, it's a town to the east. Remember somebody lost a the battle there? Who lost the battle? Joshua. 
because of Achan's sin, right? He lost the battle. So again, that is the same land where Abraham was already in. The Lord promised him he stayed there. But check this out. Maybe you never got any further in these verses and you're like, yeah, the blessings of Abraham. Check the verse 10. Here it says, as he was approaching the border of Egypt, sorry, going back, uh, there, was, there, was, there, was, there was famine in the land where he was. And then the famine pushed him to go down to Egypt. Verse 10, at the time, a severe famine struck the land of Canaan, forcing Abraham to go down to Egypt where he lived as a foreigner. And then there's a story about him lying about his wife Sarai, that is his sister, and Pharaoh takes Sarai to, to, to be his wife, but the Lord intervenes and he says that he shouldn't have done that. One interesting detail, the Lord sent plagues in Egypt, before the ten plagues that we read, in the times of Abraham, he sent plagues in order to liberate his wife Sarah and Abraham again from the hands of Pharaoh. And then again, Abraham stayed there for some time, and then he is released, and then he is sent back. You know, verses 17 to 20 talks about that, and then he comes back and settles again into the Promised Land. So yes, for a brief moment, he was also driven into Egypt but he did not stay there yes. amen? amen he did not stay there he came back he kept his eyes on the promised land he said I'm not gonna go down there and be there forever God created situation so he could also come back God had to send plagues again on on Pharaoh and if, if things wouldn't have gone wrong maybe Abraham would have stayed there but that situation forced him to come back into the promised land Isaac encountered famine not Isaac always. <laughs> Isaac Abraham. Isaac Abraham. Isaac Abraham's son. He encountered famine as well. And his story is highlighted in Genesis chapter 26. This beautiful story of that, that account there. And verse 1 says, A swear famine now struck the land as happened before in Abraham's time. So Isaac moved to Gerah, where Abimelech king of the Philistines lived. Now, Gerar was part of the promised land. It was part of Canaan. Amen. So he just moved a little bit closer. But you know where Gerar was? Gerar was on the way to Egypt. It was just bordering land with Egypt. So Isaac moves very close. Why did people always wanted to go to Egypt? Come on, somebody asked me that. Why did people always wanted to go to Egypt? There was provisions there. Egyptians, you know, pyramids, and they, they, were, they were ahead of time they had everything which is why they always and this is how the world attracts us everything everything can be provided for me if i can just you know do a little bit of a skull degree here and there and and you know sort of compromise my faith provision attracts us good things attract us egypt is attractive egypt by default is attractive because it is not built on the premise of God. It is built on the premises of pharaohs and foreign gods. So Egypt was always a place that people got attracted to. There can be a time when the Lord may allow Egypt and Egypt to serve a purpose. But then we must come back into the promises and the promised land of God. Amen. So look, this is what happened. Maybe you never noticed these details, but I love these small details. In the word of God. Verse 2 it says. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said what? Please somebody read it for me. Come on. Amen. So the Lord appears to him and stop me. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on Isaac. Hold on. Stop the car right now. Right where you are Gera. Just stay here. Don't cross over into Egypt. Do not cross over into Egypt. And I want to tell you something today. Now I don't know who you are, what you are planning, where the Lord is leading you or not leading you. Maybe you don't know, but maybe if there is a plan in your heart, in your mind, in your 
in your soul something that you're deciding something that is not in accordance to the will of God the Lord says do not go down to Egypt amen, amen. do not go down to the place that the Lord has not called you to amen. do not go down to the place that is not for you that is not the promised land that God's given you stay in Gerar and the Lord will provide and, and the last verse it says in 6 so Isaac stayed in Gerar and the Lord provided and the Lord gave him everything that he needed and made him successful. Amen. God had to intervene into Isaac's plan. By default, we tend to, to sort of attract ourselves towards things that are easy, at face value, look good, look easy, look nice, look pretty or handsome in some cases or beautiful in some cases and but we don't know if that is the promise of God yeah you shouldn't be you're already but I understand I understand um, we need to know the will of God before we make our move into the next place into the next thing people compromise getting married to non-committed Christians just because there's a famine in their life of good men or whatever it may be. People compromise their faith. They stop coming to church because Sunday pays well. I can watch it online on Monday. It's the same thing. It's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. I don't know what Egypt there's been in your life. Sometimes we just move away from the will of God and the plan of God. And we build ourselves houses in Egypt. But look at this, Isaac. We can learn something the way he responded to this famine situation. In verses 26, in, in chapter 26, verses 20 to 25, it talks about that when, when God appeared to Isaac in the night of his arrival, I am the God of your father Abraham. He said, do not be afraid for I am with you and will bless you. I will multiply your descendants and they will become a great nation. I will do this because of my promise to Abraham, my servant. Then, in that place where Isaac encountered God. Okay, this is an important point. This is an important point. The place of promise. The place of the will of God. The place where God met with Isaac. The place where he had established a relationship with God. That place, that is where he built an altar to the Lord. Amen. Amen? Amen. I still remember the place where I encountered God, you know, for the first time on my encounter weekend in 2004 in St. Peter's Field. Since then, the barn is gone and has become something else. It was a beautiful barn. But my memory is associated. Why did people do that? Abraham in Sachem, he built an altar. You see that theme running throughout. They encounter God in a place and they start building an altar. Why? Because they just don't want to forget that association. They just don't want to break that connection that they had built with God. Do you know what I'm trying to say? They don't, in other words, let me just say this plainly. They don't want to leave the church where they met God. Amen? Amen? Amen. They don't want to move that place. Because that is the place where God first met them, provided for them. Yes, God can lead us to go somewhere, but that has to be the will of God. Not my plan, not my will. Yes. Amen. I'm not saying that this is your church for your entire life and for your next generations. And, and even when Matthias will be pastor here, your kids must come here. I'm not saying that. Okay. But I am saying that as well. If the Lord leads. And if the Lord doesn't come back before that. And if Matthias becomes a pastor. That's a big if. That's a big if. Okay. Right now I will not choose him. But uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He can lead crash men. So where the Lord encounters you. Where you encounter. There you shall build the altar. You bring that association. The friends. The families. The colleagues in the church, the place, the community, the home group. We still have a very good relationship. Pastor Johnny was my best man at my, at my, my wedding because he was my home group leader. 
we still have that good friendship. We go spa, we go swimming, we do things together. We build that friendship because he was like a mentor to me. When I was in Bible college, just, just growing up in faith. He was much younger then, obviously. <laughs> we still got the youthful in him. He'll still jump in the cold water with me in the middle of December in, in, uh, in Gaza. You know. It's fine. Praise the Lord. So Isaac built that association, an ongoing connection that he must not forget. In Genesis 24, verses 1 to 8, there's a story about Abraham looking for a wife for Isaac, the same man. Okay, maybe he didn't trust Isaac much and this is why maybe God had to intervene in Isaac's life and said, do not go down to Egypt. Okay, and he said to his servant, go find a wife, you know, I think that's a better solution. I think that is a solution. I just got that for a lot of us who are not married. Just get somebody to find a husband or wife for you. Okay, let them do the job for you. All right, if you just can't make a decision, do what Harun did. Praise the Lord. Um, Genesis chapter 24, verses 1 to 8. 24 verse 8. This is what it says. Under no circumstances are you to take my son there. Okay? Under no circumstances you are to take my son to a foreign land. I don't want him to move out of the will of God. I don't want him to go and get attracted by some of the other women. Maybe they've got more beautiful women, but I don't want him to go there. Amen. I don't want him to intermarry into a different race or religion. I want him to stay in the promised land because I know my son. Maybe if he goes there, he'll be attracted by everything that is happening there. And he'll just get settled there. And we will miss out Abraham that had that wisdom to stay in the promised land to start with. So he takes an oath with his servant and says, don't you ever take my son there. Promise me you won't do it. And the servant said, okay, fine. The way they took an oath was to put the hand under the thigh. I mean, I don't know what that means. But anyway, anyway. So look what happens. He stays there. The wife comes over to him. Okay. So that's a, uh, something there as well for us to consider, whether husband travels or wife travels. You know, you know. Israelites and the family. Israelites and the family. Israelites and the family. They encountered family. Now we're coming back to the story I started with. This is what happened. Abraham stayed on track. Isaac stays on track. Jacob stays on track. He populates the land of Canaan. They are flourishing there. He's got 12 sons. Once been carried, you know the story of Joseph by the Ishmaelites and he's going to be in Egypt preparing for a famine that is to come. Okay? You with me so far? Yes. He's preparing for the famine that is to come. And in, in, uh, in, in another uh, chapter here in Genesis 45, 9 to 11, it says, sorry, before that there's another verse in Genesis 42 verses 1 to 2 and it says when Jacob heard that grain was available in Egypt, he said to his sons, why are you standing around looking at one another. I have heard there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy enough grain to keep us alive. Otherwise, we'll die. So famine struck the promised land. You know the story. Joseph had already been sent ahead to prepare the way. Seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. 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 And for the rest of you, let's do it again. Seven years of and, and seven years of? Seven. And people at the back because you didn't join in. Seven years of? <laughs> seven years of? And the seven years of? So Joseph had been sent ahead to prepare the way. Great plan. You know, God ordained this and that's great. So Jacob sends his sons. We know the story. They encounter Joseph. They find out the family connection. And Joseph then says to them, in verses, uh, chapter 45, verses 9 to 11. Now hurry back to my father and tell him. This is what your son Joseph says. God has made me master of all the land, so come down to me immediately. He invites them to come down to Egypt. He brings his family back into Egypt. In verse 11, he says, I'll take care of you there. For there are still five years of famine ahead of us. Otherwise, you, 
your household and all of your animals will starve. And that's great. That's the plan of God. God ordained it. God, God wanted it to happen. But look, two years of famine of those seven years have already lapsed. Only another five years are left. Turn to somebody next to you and tell them only five years were left in the famine. This is important. Only five years were left of the famine. Okay? Guys, this is where my heart sinks. And it's like such a blunder took place in this story. Such a blunder that maybe nobody ever talked to you about. A blunder that Israelites made. Of course, plan. Of course, provision. Genesis 47, 27 to 31 talks about Goshen becoming the promised land. Joseph gives them the land of Goshen. Meanwhile, the people of Israel settled in the region of Goshen in Egypt. There they acquired property and they were fruitful. And their population grew rapidly. If you have a lot of children, that doesn't necessarily mean you're in the will of God. Pastor Johnny? I'm just, I'm just saying it. That, you know, the population grew of Israelites, okay? And they were fruitful. So the fruitfulness and the growth in population was not a sign that God was in it. It's in the Bible. It's not my interpretation. It's clearly in the Bible. They settled in the land of Goshen, the garlic and the fish, and everything else that they started to enjoy, the foreign goats, the lavish lifestyle, the free money, the free money that a lot of us might have enjoyed, the free money. I'm not saying you did, I'm just saying, I'm just, I'm just looking at you. Maybe look at somebody else. No, nobody do no, Let's not look at anybody. Maybe the free money that somebody enjoyed during COVID, okay? You get used to it. It's hard to come off those things. Joseph is in charge. Everything is at your disposal. Let's enjoy life. Wow. We are having great time here. Joseph, you're the man. Yes, your dream was right, my brother. God sent you here for this. This is it. <coughs> this is it. We are in the promised land now. Abraham got it all wrong. Isaac got it all wrong. Jacob is already on his way out. Who cares? We are the ones who's going to take the legacy forward. This is the promised land. They got mixed feeling of the promised land now. Five years left in famine. How many years did they spend again? Somebody remind me. 430 years. 430 years. That's 425 years more than they were supposed to be. Once you go down Egypt, there is no guarantee how long it will take for you to come. It's better not to go down to Egypt in the first place. Which is why Isaac was stoned. Something went wrong somewhere. And then Joseph is about to die and he's on his deathbed and he's pleading his son that when I die, please take my bones out of this place. At least do me this favor. I don't know how he got stuck here. It's been 17 years for me and I don't know how all these people just want to continue to stay here. But do me one favor. Take my bones out. That's not good. That's not good. Why take the bones into the promised land? What's the bones going to do? It's not good. They shouldn't have stayed there for that long. But the problem is there was famine. And how we respond to famine is important. And this message is to prepare you for the famines that may come in this world. We just had a taster of a famine. And that was an easy one. Trust me, the enemy is not standing still. He's planning famines upon famines upon famines to be unleashed in the world. Because the Bible says, Jesus predicted in the last days, there will be famines, wars, plagues, earthquakes, all of that will be unleashed on the world. Yes. There will be famine of the word of God. 
There will be famine of correct doctrinal teachings. And how we prepare ourselves for the famine determines. This is why I said this message may apply to you right now or may apply to you in the future. The effects of the famine can completely dislocate us from the will of God entirely. And we start to think that Goshen is the promised land. Goshen was never supposed to be the promised land. Goshen was supposed to be a momentary provision from God for the people of Israel. They mistake that. They took that for a mistake and they believe that Goshen is now the promised land. So my friends, what I'm trying to say is that when you are excelling in life, when you're doing well, your business is flourishing, you're being fruitful, and everything is going well, that does not necessarily mean that we are in the will of God. Come on. Yes. Somebody say amen. amen. That does not testify and guarantee that we are right there in the center of the will of God. Amen. We might be in Goshen. And if we don't get out of Goshen, the time that God says we need to be in, we may just end up there. Five years became 400, 430 years, generations. And what did they end up becoming there? Started very well, started great. Oh, we are the kings of the land. We got everything under our control. Our brother, the little brother over there, Joseph, he scored it all under his control. You don't talk to me like that, you Egyptian. You know who I am? I am family of Joseph, by the way. You can't talk to me like that. 430 years later. <clears throat> Where are the bricks? Excuse me. You, slave boy, come here. Where are the bricks? Where is the, where is the? Come on, get to work. More pressure. Mm -hmm. I, want, I want more bricks than you did yesterday. Mm -hmm. More hard work. You go to work overtime now. You want provision? You want the fish and the garlic? I'll give it to you. But you got to work a bit more. Yes. Ah, Sabbath? What is Sabbath? We don't do Sabbath in Egypt. What, what's that concept? Well, come on, you got to work seven days a week if you want a little bit of provision for you. It starts well, but end up horribly wrong. Yes. Horribly wrong. And the proof is right there in front of us. There was another famine. There was another famine. Naomi. Naomi. We studied the book of Ruth. And this is an example of somebody responding to famine without knowing what God wants them to do. This is what happened in Ruth. One to five. A very sad story again. There's some really sad stories in the Bible. They're there for you to learn from them. Amen. They're there for our, our, our upbringing. Prepare us that we might end up in a situation like that. In the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home. It doesn't say a man from Judah started praying and fasting. If that line would have been there, this story would have been completely different altogether. A complete different perspective. I'll be singing praises of Mr. Malik here. But Mr. Malik did not pray, did not fast, and being the head of the house, he says, Naomi, come on, pack up the bags and the boys. We're going. We're going on a journey. We're going. We're leaving. There's famine in this country. I don't know what's going to happen. But let's go to Moab. Mm. The Moabites, the enemies of the Israelites. Yeah. Yeah. The enemies of the Israelites. He takes them there, taking his wife and two sons with him. The man's name was uh, Ali Malik. I like to call him Mr. Malik. And his wife was Naomi. Their two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem. A great clan to be from, by the way, in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab, they settled there. Aha. Uh -huh. They just settled there. This is it. Let's just settle. This is good land. S looks good. This is it. That's where we, we should be. But look at this, what happens in verse 3. Ali Malik dies. Ali Malik dies. And it's, yeah. it's questionable why he died. But people say because of 
because of, of famine. And Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons, check their character here. Like I said to you, famine determines our character, by the way. The two sons died. Do you want to read that for me? The two sons, what did they do? The two sons? The two sons married Moabite women. You're missing that one. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah and the other named Ruth. And obviously we know the stories of, of Ruth and how Ruth was a blessing and, and how God used her. But they both died. They died. Most of the scholars will agree on this. They died because they intermarried into different cultures. Into Jewish culture. They were from Jewish culture. They intermarried into a completely different culture. They died. God's judgment was upon them. So what should be our response in the famine situation? Just a few quick points and we're going to come to an end. I want to tell you, when the famine is over, first thing we go to know, we need to know his voice. We need to know his word. If we don't know his voice, if we don't know his word, we will end up wrong. We were in Uganda. And... Uh, you know, we went to a town called Apache. It's really far. It's like seven hours drive from Kampala to start with. We went there and we did our ministry. And the next day we found out that there is a ferry. And if we took the ferry, it can reduce our journey from seven to eight hours to five hours. I like the idea of ferry. I said, this is great. And we asked the, the person, the pastor there, and he, he said, look, I've not done it, but I know it's like about 40, 45 minutes drive down. The road you get to the ferry point it connects you to the other side and then you just take the tarmac and it's three to four hours driving to kampala i'm like praise the lord <laughs> hallelujah god why did nobody ever told us about this ferry anyway after about 30 minutes of drive the the pastor gets up he said look this is the straight road now you stay on this road and you'll get to the ferry very soon and the last ferry was supposed to be 6 30 we were aiming to get there According to the time given by five. So you might even catch an earlier ferry. I'm like, it would be nice over the Nile, you know, looking at the ferry, the cars, it would be a great trip. And we were all like happy, you know. Is that right, Brother Pascal? Okay. <laughs> After about 10 minutes on that road that leads to ferry, the tire went really badly. We had a spare tire, praise God. We went to the spare tire, the spare tire is flat. The Lord sent, I don't know, I'm not going to say an angel, you'll know why. The Lord sent somebody to help us. And uh, he's a motor boda guy. He's got a bike and he's come and he said, look, let's just go and um, I'll get this tire fixed. We'll get it pumped up. The tire got pumped up. We wasted about one hour there. But we, we're still okay for time. It's about uh, 5.45, you know. And uh, we are thinking to ourselves, okay, we can still make it to the ferry in time. And he says, this motor boda guy says, look, there's a number of a guy. I know he works at the ferry. You talk to him, maybe, you know, just he'll tell you the times. And so we said, oh, praise God. Okay, let's go. Spare wheel. It's just a short journey. But I'm looking at my Apple Maps. I'm trying to figure this out because there is a, there's a point where the ferry crosses over to the other side. Okay? And I'm thinking and I'm looking at the speed by which the car is moving. And I'm thinking, it, it's not going to reach there in 10, 15 minutes. It's going to take hours to get there. But anyway, we had this number and we're talking to this guy. And this guy could speak the Northern Ugandan language and he could speak the, the actual Ugandan as well and English as well. And when his phone rang, there was like a message, you know. And uh, anyway, he's like, yeah, where are you guys? Tell me what can you see? And like, yeah, we can see this. And that's fine. Don't worry. I'm holding the ferry for you. This road is just not ending. I'm cutting the story short. This road was quite remote. Driving next to River Nile, it was getting late. We even killed an animal a large size animal by accident on the way there and that this road would just just wouldn't end and we eventually got to the ferry point this guy is still calling us to say look the ferry just come quickly i can't wait any longer it is now 7 45 and i'm thinking to myself this guy thinks that maybe some foreigners are involved he's going to take some extra money and he's going to still take the ferry across to the other side everybody on the ferry is going to be really angry at us because we made them wait we got there it's dark i got to the barrier and i spoke to the policeman i said we're here for the ferry he said which ferry i said the ferry to the other side so the ferry left at 6 45. 
you're one hour late. I said, look, there's this guy. So I called the number. The guy heard that policeman's uh, voice. He stopped. He hung up. He said, who's this guy you've been talking to? Why did you take his word for it? Why did you just listen to this random guy? And you've turned up. He said, he asked me, where'd you come from? We said, a patch. Patch. He said, patch. <laughs> he told you to come. He said, fairy. He said, maybe five, ten minutes if you spoke to the right person. But he said, this is crazy. Now, we've traveled in an opposite direction for three years. Sorry, three, three hours. The original, the original, it's felt like that. The original journey would have been seven hours if we would have just taken the tarmac. Now, the journey became 10 hours. We drove through some terrain. They're not roads. Forest, buffaloes coming from everywhere. If the car would have broken down, you know, I will be a martyr by crocodiles. You know, things would have happened to us in that place, I'm telling you. It was dangerous. We drove through that train on a spare wheel for four hours to get to a tarmac road. We bought petrol mixed with kerosene in order to survive and make sure that we make that journey. From the ferry point, we managed to get some black market petrol in order to make that journey because we're low on fuel. We got to the tarmac. The first thing we did, we found a petrol station. Check this out. We go to the petrol station. We looked at the car and we said, let's just take the tires around. In front of my eyes, the spare wheel went flat. But I thank God that it went flat at the petrol station. I said, we're not waiting anymore. We have no other tire. Another Mota Boda guy came. I said, look, just send a taxi. Go further up. You know, we just want to take taxi to Kampala. It was still another five hour journey. Okay, our battery packs, our batteries, everything is dying. Everything is going. We're losing connection even with Pastor Mike and Pastor Mike, praise God, he, he couldn't sleep. He was staying awake. This is like 1 a.m. in the morning now. We started our journey 4 uh, p.m. Already been nearly eight hours, nine hours. And we still got another four hours. There was a caretaker at the petrol station. He said, look, we have a tire repair shop here. I can't repair it. It's 1 a.m. I'm going to call the guy who's in charge. If he picks up, he picks up. He picked up. He picked up. And he came and he said, it's just the wall. Two minutes, he fixed. I gave him 10,000 shillings, which equals to two pounds. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was big money. It was big money for him, okay? I said, thank you, my brother, for coming out. Hey, Chico, how much do you want? He said, 10,000. I said, take 12. You know, I gave him and he was so happy. But anyway, so he fixed it. He said, this car tire hopefully can take you to Kampala. By the way, two of my passengers at this time were sleeping. <laughs> they did not even know that this breakdown had happened. And this happened. But that's okay. Praise God, they had some rest. On the road, the car broke down again. Then one of the passengers who was sitting in the church woke up. And he said, I'll help you this time. And uh, we managed to get the car back on the track again. Amen. We were in famine. We were in need. We were under time pressure. We were under time constraint. We gave into the word of this random guy. Not knowing who he is. We just believed him. In the times of famine, what should be our response? The point is there. We need to know the word of God, the voice of God. Go back. Amos 8, 11 says, Time is surely coming, says the sovereign Lord. When I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or water, but of hearing the words of God. Hearing, not speaking. It's not that God's going to stop speaking, but people are going to stop listening to the word of God. Yes. And when we don't listen to the word of God, we end up in famine. We trusted this random guy and that made our journey from 7 to 14 hours. 5.30 a.m. We go to the hotel. We had to stay awake after two hours because we had our PCR test lined up. And the same night was our flight and we had to take those PCR tests. So we couldn't even sleep and it was a night flight but praise God we came back and praise God that we we survived by the river Nile. I've done half of the river Nile traveling in Uganda. River Nile is, is one of the longest rivers in the world. We need to trust God despite how long the wait is. Job 5.28 says he will save you from death in time of famine for the power of the sword in the time of war. We 
we need to follow full directions. I just want to make this point quite importantly. We need to follow full directions of God. Okay? Full directions of God. Have you ever wondered why did Magi turn up at Herod's palace following the star? Did the star lead them there? Why did they end up in, 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 in Herod's place? They were doing so great. They saw the star in the east. They followed it all the way to Bethlehem. But they turned up at the wrong place. I believe when they got to Bethlehem, they said, switch the sat nav off. We know our way here. Oh, it's a king who's coming into the world. A king is born. Let's go to the king and congratulate him. Oh, your son, you know, we know he's the future Messiah. He's the king. They trusted their own interpretation. And it says later the star appeared to them again and guided them back. The verse is there. The verse is there in Matthew 2, 9. After this interview, the wise men, they went their way and the star they had seen in the east guided them into Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. At a point, the wise men, they called the wise men, they stopped following the star all the way. Have you never noticed that? That is why they turned up at Herod's place. And they said to Herod, where is, this, where is the promised son? Where is the promised Messiah? Please stand with me as we come to a conclusion. Prepare for the famine hand. I talked about hunger and starvation. Famine hits hunger and starvation. You know, fasting helps us. Fasting helps us. Fasting prepares us. Jesus fasted for 40 days for a reason. Okay? He fasted for 40 days for a reason because he was being prepared for a famine type situations when food is taken away from you. When what you depend on is taken away from you. Fasting, praying, it helps us. In James chapter 4, there is a verse. It says that, look, you say today or tomorrow we are going to a certain town and we're going to stay there, we're going to do business there, we're going to go and get rid of a lot of things, we're going to be settled in that town. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? What your life is like the morning, fog, it's like a little time while then it's gone. What you ought to say, this is important. Now I'm going to finish with this verse. This is what the Bible says. This is what we are to say. If the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this and that. Otherwise, you are boasting about your own pretentious plans and all such boasting is evil. So let us get rid of self-confidence. Self-confidence drives us into Egypt. Self-confidence drives us out of the will of God into the will of the enemy. Self-confidence is one of those things that we need to get rid of our life. Not depending on our own plans, but depending on what God wants us to do.